Tolstoy was one of the most influential writers ever. He hated his Anna Karenina and War and Peace, but he wanted all his works to enter the public domain, to be available to everyone for free. He was vegetarian, he contributed to the development of Christian anarchy, he founded a school for peasants and worked there with his daughters, and he was a decent shoemaker, among other things. There's a joke. Leo, dressed in his Tolstoy shirt, is writing a novel. A butler, dressed in fancy clothes, comes in and says, Your Excellency, the plow is served. He influenced people like Gandhi, Chekhov, Nabokov, Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, and basically everyone else. He rejected the Nobel Prize. He really was larger than life. How can you approach him? Which books do you read, except Anna Karenina and War and Peace? Where do you start? The death of Ivan Ilyich is the account of the life and death of a judge. It asks the question, how can you make peace with your own mortality? How can you accept the impermanence of things? Well, usually you can't. That's why your mind plays so many tricks on you to avoid thinking about this. Being aware of your death changes the way you experience life. And this is what this novella is about. Tolstoy describes the different physical sensations, the mood swings, the changing psychological states, the soul searching, the alienation. He summarizes someone's life as follows. The past history of Ivan Ilyich was most simple and ordinary and most terrible. Simple and ordinary are synonymous with terrible here. You see, the protagonist was a judge, and for some reason the author had a problem with judges. You can see it in his other works too. He thought that laws, no matter how perfect, go against human nature. I'll go into more detail about it later. An ordinary man cannot take it upon himself to decide the fates of other ordinary men. Whereas before Ivan Ilyich was the judge, now he has to be the defendant in a court where all the human laws are null and void. His illness is as dispassionate as a perfect judge. Dying takes the human out of the mundane. It forces him to see everyone, including himself, in a new light. Every detail becomes obvious. Everything is more intense. Ivan Ilyich, like most people, finds it hard to believe that death will actually happen to him. His family and friends want to get it over with. They are preoccupied with formalities, with saying the proper things, with trying to console him. In truth, they are simply happy that this time death has come to someone else. Death is an abstract concept that one should avoid if they want to go on playing stupid games. There are the things that people prioritize, and there are the things that actually matter, and they are not the same. The only character who actually empathizes with Ivan Ilyich is a simple man named Gerasim. He literally takes on the protagonist's pain. You will understand what I'm talking about if you read the book. Just like Bulgakov said, yes, man is mortal, but that would be only half the trouble. The worst of it is that he is sometimes unexpectedly mortal. There's the trick. Man is mortal, but the fact that he's unaware of his mortality makes his death so unexpected. The death of Ivan Ilyich is ultimately a portrayal of a meaningless life. According to Tolstoy, men wouldn't be so afraid of death if they didn't put themselves above others. Otherwise, they will inevitably ask the question, why me? The next short story, Father Sergius or Father Sergi, discusses the pitfalls of monasticism. It's about resisting temptation and finding spiritual fulfillment. A charismatic prince served in the army and was a very ambitious young man. He didn't drink, he didn't lead a dissolute life, and he gave half of his fortune to his sister. He loved the Tsar Nikolai I and he loved his fiancée, who seemed so pure and innocent. Apparently she was the mistress of the Tsar, so this was a double betrayal. Our prince abandoned his military career and 
went on to become a priest after breaking off his engagement. This is how he became Father Sergi. What follows is even more interesting than what I discussed. This is a story about corruption, about recognizing one's mistakes, about having doubts, about being humble and childlike when you want to learn something. The author stresses the idea that intention and action are very different sometimes. Avoiding temptation when it's not around you, it's so much easier. It's great if you're interested in Tolstoy's spiritual side. He wasn't too fond of dogmatic theology or monks, not even Father Ambrose, who probably served as a prototype of Father Zasima in The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. So yeah. The Kreutzer Sonata is probably Tolstoy's most controversial book. Although it's a work of a genius, of a prolific writer, of one of the most influential thinkers, it's still a 19th century man discussing relations between men and women. It hasn't aged well, considering its sexist undertones, among other things. If you only read Anna Karenina and were in peace, this will probably surprise you. Some passengers on the train engage in an interesting conversation about love and marriage. The protagonist says that he killed his wife. He then proceeds to tell his story to an unnamed passenger. He had many vices as a young man, but back then he believed that he was a moral person. He went to public houses because it was an acceptable activity even a healthy one. He says that real ladies are just as bad as prostitutes, but they are pricier. They are treated like cattle when they want to make a good match. Although at first he says that women are the victims, he later calls them perpetrators. He thinks that women are taught how to become appealing to men. So the sole purpose of women is to attract men into their web to get them horny so they become addicted. Thus, women make men buy them shiny things. He's trying to debunk gender roles. He thinks that patriarchy is detrimental for everyone, though he doesn't choose the best words to describe it. For him, sex is a sin, desire is bondage, and abstinence would be the solution. Our hero fell in love with a woman and they got married. The woman, the wife, remains unnamed, obviously. Our hero discovers that marriage is not as good as it seems. Jealousy wasn't the only reason he committed the crime. He did what he did because he saw that his wife became a real artist with another man, whereas with him, she couldn't be that. The Kreutzer Sonata is a challenging piece, and if you can play it on the piano, you're good. You can enjoy this story if you think of it as a portrayal of a villain trying to justify his actions. It is extremely well written, duh, <laughs> though the passages about women can be frustrating. It also can be funny. Here's an example. I wanted to run after him, but remember that it would be ridiculous to go running after my wife's lover in my stocking feet. And I didn't want to be ridiculous. I wanted to be frightening. Despite the terrible rage I was in, I was aware all the time of the impression I was making on others. See? <laughs> Theo's wife, Sofia Talstaya, helped him a lot with his work. She copied War and Peace several times and Actually, some fragments from War and Peace were taken from her unpublished short story called Natasha. The Tolstoys were in the happiest couple at that moment in time. Sofia wasn't too happy about the Kreutzer Sonata. She thought that it exposed their most intimate secrets and that it killed the remains of their love. It's really heartbreaking. Although you can separate the art from the artist, you can deny that it was a dick move on Leo's part. Sophia wrote her response, her own perspective on the story, and her work Who's to Blame. It was published years after her death, and I read it a month ago, and I reviewed it in my August reading wrap-up, if you want to check it out. 
The Living Corpse is a play published after Tolstoy's death. Although there are many characters listed on the first page, it's easier to keep up with them than if it were a novel. Unlike with other things written later in his career, I didn't feel like I was being lectured here. It was based on a true story, by the way. The protagonist isn't the greatest husband ever, he drinks, he's careless with money, and his wife Lisa decides to break up with him. Her mother supports her, hoping that she will reunite with an old friend, Viktor Karenin. I know, Karenin. They seem to be in love with each other, but Lisa decides to give her husband a last chance and sends Karenin after him. He finds him surrounded by officers and gypsies and the husband refuses to come home. All the main characters are really worthy people. They are ready to make sacrifices for their loved ones, but how do they solve this problem? Well, we know how Anna Karenina solved it, so don't expect a comedy. I can't go into more details without spoiling the whole thing. The next book, A Confession, would be a really great choice if you want to get to know Tolstoy. It's about his struggle with midlife crisis. He was very big on personal development. He worked hard on himself and made up rules for himself in his diaries. These rules were meant to organize his life and help him overcome his weaknesses. If you've ever made plans for yourself, you know that they don't always work. This happened a lot to Tolstoy and he would repent for his sloth and his wild lifestyle and then he would make new plans, then the cycle repeats. He had an existential crisis once in a while. This one was probably his biggest. Through his confession, he was trying to understand the meaning of life. Some critics think that this is his greatest work. He pours his heart out talking about life, death, morality and spirituality. He writes, when I thought of the fame which my works had gained me, I used to say to myself, well, what if I should be more famous than Gogol, Pushkin, Shakespeare, Molière, than all the writers in the world? Well, and what then? I could find no reply. Such questions demand an answer, and an immediate one. Without one, it is impossible to live. But answer, there was none. The first phase of his spiritual life is his blind belief in God. Then he goes through a nihilistic period, then he believes in progress, then he tries to go to church, but it's, he can't do it, it's too fake. And then he finds his own version of God. He discovers God not through reason, but rather intuition. And his God is more pantheistic than it is Christian. This isn't a confession about his whole life, only the parts that caused him trouble or insomnia. There are moments when he feels suicidal, outside some paragraphs, so trigger warning. Thus I, a healthy and happy man, was brought to feel that I could live no longer, that an irresistible force was dragging me down into the grave. The idea of suicide came as naturally to me as formerly that of bettering my life. It had so much attraction for me that I was compelled to practice a species of self-deception in order to avoid carrying it out too hastily. I was unwilling to act hastily only because I had determined first to clear away the confusion of my thoughts and that once done, I could always kill myself. I was happy, yet I hid away a cord to avoid being tempted to hang myself by it to one of the pegs between the cupboards of my study, where I undressed myself alone every evening and ceased carrying a gun because it offered too easy a way to, of getting rid of life. I knew not what I wanted. I was afraid of life. I shrank from it, and yet there was something I hoped for. The mental state in which I then was seemed to me summed up in the following. My life was a foolish and wicked joke played upon me by I knew not whom. Notwithstanding my rejection of the idea of a creator, that of a being who thus wickedly and foolishly made a joke of me, seemed to me the most natural of all conclusions. 
and the one that threw the most light upon my darkness. Illness and death would come. Indeed, they had come. If not today, then tomorrow. To those whom I loved, to myself. And nothing would remain but stench and worms. All my acts, whatever I did, would sooner or later be forgotten. And I, myself, am nowhere. This is Tolstoy. This is a successful man loved by millions. If he could have moments of despair and doubt, so can you. In both cases, these feelings are valid. The next nonfiction book, What I Believe, is not for starters. Tolstoy didn't want to just express his beliefs, but also to offer guidance to others. He didn't like to believe something just because someone told him to. He didn't trust the interpretations of the Bible provided by the church. He wanted to rediscover it for himself. He learned Hebrew and Greek to read and translate the text. I want to preface this by saying I'm not an expert on the Bible, so I'm just going to assume that his translations are more or less accurate. He doesn't like the church and the church doesn't like him. He uses strong language against it because he thinks that it betrayed the teachings of Christ by focusing on rituals and superstitions rather than on the central message. Quote, You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist evil. Tolstoy says that this sermon should be interpreted literally. When you respond to evil, you take part in evil and you extend the chain. He continues, I was also told to respect those institutions that by means of violence secured my safety from evil. I was taught to honor those institutions as being sacred. For him, these institutions are based on the law an eye for an eye and go against Christ's teachings. If Christians acted as Jesus preached, they wouldn't need a state or unchristian institutions. But they don't, so we're stuck with the institutions we have. Tolstoy also says that people misinterpret the rule do not judge. Most of us think that it refers to ordinary people, but it actually refers to judges. A trial is meant to decide someone's guilt or innocence and to punish them accordingly. That is, to act upon an eye for an eye. Violence begets violence, that's why Tolstoy was a pacifist. In the 90s, while he was working on his novel Resurrection, he used to attend hearings. One of them was the case of a man who was accused of trying to kill a prostitute. The man was drunk and he stabbed her and he didn't remember anything. He was found guilty of trying to hurt her, but the woman? started to scream. She insisted that he was trying to kill her, not to just hurt her. Tolstoy approached her and told her that the abuser was going to suffer anyway, so there's no need to be upset. He advised her to forgive him and said something about Jesus Christ. She responded with, go to hell, old man, and Tolstoy was embarrassed and left. This story illustrates that Tolstoy wasn't always successful in his attempts to help others. His approach to teaching was never force anyone to learn anything. This approach worked for him because he was Tolstoy. <laughs> Every time he entered a room, he was the most important person in that room. His reputation preceded him, that's why some of his methods can't be used by simple people. I would recommend this book to you only if you're interested in different interpretations of the teaching of Jesus Christ. I wasn't too impressed by it, but for some people it was life-changing. I hope that now you are less intimidated by this giant. Thanks for watching. Bye!